Thank you for joining me today. Together, we're going to take a look at the song Jerusalem the Golden, referencing nothing but a Bible, a dictionary, and logic to talk about what this song really means. Before we get started, let me say that this is an opinion critique that I am rationalizing with logic. If you have other thoughts and opinions, feel free to discuss those in a respectful way. Jerusalem the Golden was written by Bernard of Cluny and John M. Neal, and the music was composed by Alexander C. Ewing. There are a couple different versions with some lyrical changes. I am using the lyrics found through hymnwiki.org that list the source as the Relief Society Songbook. The link below will take you to a recording of the song, and if you want to hear it and start some lyric analysis on your own. Before we dive into the lyrics, we'd like to take a, a brief look at the form. This being a hymn, the form is a straightforward with four verses sung sequentially. The first verse goes as follows. Jerusalem the golden, with milk and honey blessed. Beneath your contemplation, sink heart and voice oppressed. I know not, oh I know not, what joys await us there, what radiance of glory, that bliss beyond compare. We start with Jerusalem the Golden, setting the scene for the song, talking about an amazing place that is heaven. Revelation 21 verse 18 says the city was pure gold, setting up an amazing place to spend eternity. The next line gives us more imagery with milk and honey blessed. The idea of milk and honey being connected with paradise is seen throughout the Old Testament and seems to have been a real favorite of Moses as it appears four times in Exodus, four times in Numbers, and six times in Deuteronomy. Now we come to Beneath Your Contemplation. And I really don't know how to take this line. Let's look at the definition of contemplation and make sure we're on the same page. The action of looking thoughtfully at something for a long time. The question is, who or what is the your referring to here? We have only talked about this city. Is the city contemplating? This just doesn't make sense until you remember to look at all of the definitions and find the one that relates specifically to Christian spirituality. A form of prayer or meditation in which a person seeks to pass beyond mental images and concepts to a direct experience of the divine. I suppose the your in this line could be God, although an all-knowing God has no need to contemplate in either definition. This leads us to sink heart and voice oppressed. With the new definition for the last line, this is then the meaning beneath the images of the gold city with milk and honey. That feels a little like a little bit of a jump. I, maybe I'm still missing the point of the contemplation, but if I'm passing beyond those images to experience the divine, I, I don't think I would explain it this way. If this is beneath God's contemplation, then it still doesn't really make sense. A sink heart, I believe we can connect to the idiom heart sinks, which has the meaning of one feels disappointed or disheartened. Voice oppressed is your thoughts being ignored and the inability to make a difference. This might not be a bad thing and will prevent the city of gold from eroding. The next line seems to start a new statement. I know not, oh I know not, what joys await me there. This is the inability to understand what life in this city will be like in the best possible sense. This has shifted back to the city and back away from the contemplation, or at least away from the disappointment and oppression. Now, we return to some descriptions uh, with what radiancy of glory. This, without the source, does, is not very descriptive, but Revelation 21 verse 23 fills in the picture. And the city has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the lamp is the lamp. This imagery is also found in Isaiah 16, verses 19 to 20. I do wish the imagery was expanded better than just one line, but when paired with the joy that is not understandable, it is a pretty straight connection. 
The verse ends with what bliss beyond compare. This is really the same statement as the joy that is waiting for us. Scripturally, it comes from 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. It is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond compare. If you stop and think about this verse, you get really caught up on the third and fourth lines, and you kind of have to ignore them or accept they make no sense and move on. Verse 2 gives us the following. They stand those halls of Zion, all jubilant with song, and bright with many an angel, and all the martyr throng. There is the throne of David, and there from toll released, the shout of them that triumph, the song of them that feast. Verse 2 really pulls from Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. So let's treat this a little different. And I'm going to go ahead and read through that whole scriptural section, and then we can take a closer look at how those lines fit logically. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne, and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressing me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where do they come? I said to him, Sir, you know, And he said to me, These are the ones coming from the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We start with, they stand those halls of Zion. This again is setting the scene for this verse. All jubilant with song. Verse 10 listed people as crying out with loud voice. The cry being praises. Now, That is all fine and scriptural based, but again, we have talked about the halls being the subject. Are the halls singing here? The definition for jubilant is feeling or expressing great happiness and triumph. This is not saying the halls are filled with song, but are joyfully singing. I understand the the point being made, but I feel like it could have been done better. Next is, and bright with many an angel, which comes from verse 11, this is a continued painting of who is in the halls, and is showing us how bright these angels are. We move to, and all the martyr throng, verse 14. Now, we get to the people that are assumed to be jubilant with song. If you are wondering on the definition of throng, it is a large, densely packed crowd of people or animals. Although this group is very close together with little room to move, they are happy beyond compare. It's hard to picture, but it is a very powerful image. The second half of the verse starts a new statement. There is the throne of David. This is giving us more information to fill the picture with. Coming from verse 15. And there from toll released. This is maybe a touch odd, but Overall, we can see that the throne released the pain and hardship of the world. Verse 16. We end the verse with the lines, The shout of them that triumph, the song of them that feast. This is more explanation of that jubilant song from earlier. I do hope that the throng of people is not actively trying to feast, as that might be a little hard when there's no space to move. But we move on to verse 3, and we have, And they who with their leader 
have conquered the fight. Forever and forever are clad in robes of white. O land that seest no sorrow, O state that fearest no strife, O royal land of flowers, O realm and home of light. Verse 3 continues to use that theme of Revelation 7. The first two lines set the scene. And they who are with their leader, having conquered in the fight. Verse 9. This is talking about the group from earlier that are standing with God, and together they have conquered death. It continues with more images from verse 9. Forever and forever are clad in robes of white. This finishes the statement that they are in eternity in white robes. We see the shift in the second half of this verse to some declarations about heaven. What is interesting about these is that they do not seem to be as directly pulled from scripture, but are, are more general statements. A land that sees no sorrow, this is a really nice and powerful thing. This is something that is impossible to wrap your head around because as humans, sorrow is everywhere. There are some uh, loose passages that point to this, uh, one of which being Proverbs 10 verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The idea is continued, O state that fearest no strife. This, again, is something hard to properly understand. There is no place on this earth with no problems and no fear. Suddenly we get to a line that, that doesn't quite feel as heavenly. A royal land of flowers. There's nothing wrong with this idea of a royal place of flowers, but it doesn't hold the same power. Flowers don't seem to be all that powerful. Is there anything special about the flowers? Maybe the line could go filled with majestic flowers. This doesn't add much depth, but it increases the imagery. The verse closes with, O oh, realm and home of life. This again feels a little less than heavenly. I understand this is the realm of eternal life, but is there not life on earth? This is very easy to be seen as earth. Even a temporary home is still a home. The whole second half of this verse is just a little lacking for my taste. Uh, you're welcome to go through and compare it to Psalm 27 or the rest of Revelation 21. For now, let's go ahead and move to verse 4. O sweet and blessed country, the home of God's elect. O sweet and blessed country, that eager hearts expect. Jesus, in mercy bring us to that dear land of rest who art with God the Father, and Spirit ever blessed. Verse 4 seems to continue kind of where verse 3 left off. O oh, sweet and blessed country. This setting is descriptive without much description. What imagery is there? What do you picture when you see this? To me, it is not visual. It's not really emotional. It's not much of anything. It does connect loosely to Psalm 33, verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom has chosen as his heritage. The statement from the first line concludes, the home of God's elect. This is really just saying that this is indeed heaven that we are talking about. There could be some theological debate on this as well, uh, but that's not the purpose of this. We now have the only repeated line in the song with, O oh, sweet and blessed country. This time the statement concludes with, that eager hearts expect. This is really just saying that we are eager to get to heaven. Nothing with much meaning. Jesus in mercy bring us to that dear land of rest. This statement from these two lines is a shift from the rest of the song. Everything else has been a description of Jerusalem the Golden. And now we have a statement asking us to be taken there. The statement is nice because it does include in mercy. This is a reminder that we are not worthy of being taken there, but are looking for God's mercy to get there. The song closes with these final lines, Who art with God the Father and Spirit ever blessed. This is a statement that points to the Trinity and works well, but it feels a little forced to me. And again, it carries little value to the state of the song. I think the second half of this verse in general could have been worked to really pull out the sin and forgiveness and give us some more powerful content.
let's talk about this song as a whole briefly. Realistically, there's nothing wrong with this as a possible description of heaven. Yes, it is heavily connected to parts of Revelation and other biblical passages, but it is impossible for us to fully picture what heaven would ever really look like. This means that there's pretty much no content. There's no law or gospel, and that means there's no connection to our sinful lives and forgiveness. There is a touch at the end of verse 4, but for the most part, nothing. If we go back to the question about if this song should be sung in a church, logically, there has this has no major issue. Theologically, it might depend on your beliefs, and content-wise makes me lean toward no. Maybe if the message is all about heaven and what it looks like. Overall, though, being based mostly on Revelation and having no real law or gospel makes this one a, a no for me. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Remember to be kind and respectful. Until next time, think before you sing.